Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen. Steve is um, under the weather today, so um, Cyril is going to deliver the message for us this morning, and then I'll be taking care of the rest of it. So I'm thankful for Cyril today, very much so. Um, please make sure that you check out the announcements in the bulletin. There are several things that, are be go that will be going on from now until the end of the year. Um, make sure that you take note of the fact that the West Virginia Brass Quintet will be here next week during worship. We're very excited to have them with us next week. Um, always a great start to the holiday season. Also, there is nativity practice after church today from noon to 1.30. Brittany's not going to be here, so that may not happen. I will double check here in a little bit. Um, we do have our Advent decorating next Sunday at 4 p.m., and there will be a special children's activity in the fellowship hall for the kiddos during that time. And then there's nativity practice after church on December 15th. Make sure you check out the parish house needs and all of the other events that are happening during um, these next few weeks. I want to take just a moment and thank you all for your support and your cards and your prayers uh, in the loss of my mother-in-law. You know, there are seasons that we go through that are just so hard. And this past 16 months or so has been one of those seasons for our family. But I am grateful for a church family that holds our arms up when we are weak and not able to go forward on our own. I'm thankful this morning that God is always with us and you all are his hands and his feet. So on that note, I want to thank you once again and just remind you to let go of the hard things of this life this morning and let the Lord minister to you today. Let the worship begin. Thank you, Dan. Would you all stand and join me in the choral call to worship, hymn number 99, My Tributes.
Come, people of God, come and celebrate God's gift of salvation. We come without fear. We come trusting in God. Come, people of God, hear God's promises and witness God's mighty deeds. In hearing the promises, in witnessing the mighty deeds of God, we are strengthened for all that lies ahead. Come. Let us worship and praise God by shouting aloud and singing for joy, for God truly is in our midst. Let us pray. Our loving and caring God, we need this time together to be united with our sisters and brothers in the faith. We need this time of worship to be comforted and strengthened in your presence. We hear of wars and rumors of wars. We read of persecution and oppression. Remind us again of your vision that all might live in a world of peace and justice and love. May this time together imprint this vision and promise on our hearts that we may live into this beloved community. Amen. Amen. And now let's sing with gusto, the hymn of celebration, number 57, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. seated. The Psalter this morning is Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come before you this day as those who are often afraid to confess all the many ways 
in which we have disappointed and betrayed you. You have given us continual opportunities to serve and love others, but we have withdrawn into lives of selfishness and greed. We have turned our backs on others in need. We have denied the gifts you have given us. Where can we turn now that we have run from you? Your voice calls us to come home, to come to you unafraid, to receive forgiveness and healing. Open our hearts this day to receive these magnificent blessings. Help us understand the many ways in which you love us and help us share that love with all those we meet. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Hear these words of assurance. Even though we have turned away from God, yet God is faithful to us. We are beloved of God and recipients of God's love and blessings. Rejoice, children of God, for God's mercies are ever before us. Amen. As the ushers come forward, as followers of Jesus, what is the most important thing we can do? We must love. Love God with all we are and all we have, and love others the same way. An important way that we show our love is by refusing to hoard and instead giving generously. Every time we make our offering of money and ourselves, past, present, and future to come, we are a sign of God's kingdom in this community. Let's do that now. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, whose wisdom surpasses all understanding, we offer these gifts as a token of our faith and devotion. In a world full of uncertainties, may these offerings be used to spread your love and your hope. Teach us to listen to your voice amid the noise, and to trust in your steadfast presence. Bless our giving, that it may build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to let Cyril deliver the word when he comes to give the message. And so at this time, I'd like to invite the kids to join me down at the chancel rail while the rest of us sing How I Love Jesus, verse 1. sparkly shoes. I love your dress. Everybody looks so nice. You do have a sparkly sweater. Do you guys know what this is? Have you seen somebody use something like this before? Who have you seen? Your mama. Your mama uses this. What does she use it to, to do? Charge things. Most of the time we use it to charge. You got some of these in your house? Your phones, right? Anything, right. Anything that's dying, you can charge it with your plug. I agree. I think that's perfect. Anything electric that's dying. Thank you. I sometimes forget to charge my phone. I know, isn't that terrible? And I'm worse about charging my watch. And so sometimes I go to put my watch on and I'm like, oh, darn it, I forgot to charge my watch. And so I have to get my charger out and then I have to get the right cord, right? Because not all the cords will fit into this, will they? It's a special kind of cord. This is a USB-C, I think. Uh, anyway, there's all kinds of plugs that go in there. Just hold on. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Well, do you ever feel like you need charged? Yes. Yes. Are you ever tired? Oh, my. You're tired right now? I'm a little tired right now, but I slept pretty good last night, so that's good. I'm pretty good at 
You had a sleepover. Oh my goodness, I bet you are sleepy. You had a sleepover too? Oh, okay. So when we need to get charged, we sleep, right? Yeah. You know what else can help charge us? Eating and drinking, absolutely. Drinking enough water, right? Do you, have, do you drink enough water? And playing. She drinks a lot of water, Dad. Is that right? Yeah, good. And playing. You drink a lot of water, too. And playing. Do you play with your friends? Does that charge you? It drains you? Well, I have to... I have to tell you that, you know, when I forget to charge my watch, I have to plug it in, right? When my soul is sad, do you know what I do to charge my soul? I spend time with my friend, Leanne, who's sitting over there. Can you guys wave at Leanne? She is so good for my soul. And she refreshes me and she recharges me. She's going to cry now, so... Don't look at her. <laughs> you know what else I do to recharge my soul? I sit down at the piano and I play the piano and I sing because that makes me feel so good. Do you know what else I do to recharge my soul? I come here with all of these wonderful people to learn about who? God. That's right. To talk about God and to be in his house and to learn about Jesus and everything that he did. So I want you to remember that when you are feeling tired, take a nap so you can recharge, but also find other ways to recharge your soul. And that might be with a best friend and it might be spending time with your sister or your mom and dad. It might be singing or playing, or you like playing with your mom and dad. There's so many ways to recharge. Mommy, Mommy, how can I decorate my Christmas list? You know, that's a great way to recharge is to get ready for Christmas. So the next time you see one of these plugs, I want you to remember what we talked about today, okay? To recharge your soul, we don't plug into the wall, do we? We plug into friends and family, but most important, we plug into Jesus. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these young people and for the ways that they recharge my soul. Their smiles and their, the things they want to tell us, they're just so full of joy, and we love them so much. God, would you just bless them throughout their days? Lord, remind all of us to, when we're plugging in our phones or our watches, to plug back into you. That when we are weary, when we are tired, when we are sad, that we just need to plug in to you because you bring us restoration and strength and you charge us back up to do your work. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said Amen. 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 All right, it's time for Children's Church. Yay! Yay. Oh, what else? What charges me? That's always an adventure. <laughs> okay, I had to get the choir to prompt me what happens next. So, would you join me in the choral call to prayer? Number 473, lead me, Lord, you may remain seated.
Let us pray. God of new beginnings, you have promised us a season in which weeping will no longer be heard, nor cries of distress. Yet we live in a season filled with weeping and distress. This day we come before you offering prayers for those who weep with grief, for those who mourn the death of loved ones, the loss of employment, the pain of transition. This day we come before you offering prayers for those who cry out in distress, for the rumblings of hungry bellies, the lament of the addict, the pleas of the homeless. This day we come before you offering prayers for those who labor in vain, for those enslaved in fields, factories, and mines, for those who work cripples their bodies and their spirits, for those who's to who toil without recognition, wage, or honor. You have promised us a season of blessing you have promised us a season of peace. We pray for the coming of that holy time throughout your beloved creation for the sake of your beloved Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now, resting in that promise that we are his beloved children, let us pray the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
to ask me to preach today I can't say no to him he's one of my best friends in the world so after I had said yes he must have heard sort of a panic in the word and uh, he said well you know you could do like the old preacher in the story and wait a minute are you calling me old well I guess he was, <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> he said, like the old preacher in the story who was filling in, and all through the service, he sat in the back of the church, and when it was time to preach, he come down the aisle, faced the cross, pointed at it, and stood there silent for several minutes, and then he left. And... That started a thought in my head and reminded me of a sermon I'd used in one of my interim pastorates. And I looked it up and it's called, When You Come to a Fork in the Road. And I'd like to share that with you today. The scripture is taken from, Matthew, from Mark chapter 8, beginning at 31st verse. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and rebuke, began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel, will save it. The message puts it this way. He then began, to explain, he began explaining things to them, and he said, It is necessary for the Son of Man to proceed to an ordeal of suffering. He must be tried and found guilty by the elders and the high priests and the religious scholars. He must be killed, and after three days rise again, alive. He said this simply and clearly so they couldn't miss it. But Peter grabbed him in protest and turning to him and, and seeing his disciples wavering, pondering what to believe, Jesus said, Peter, get away from me. You Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. And calling the crowds he brought to join his disciples, he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. 
According to the great font of wisdom, Yogi Berra, if you come to a fork in the road, you take it. Well, okay. <laughs> that doesn't tell me anything. Of course, that's how his mind worked. The text in Mark 8 marks a, for, a, a fork in the road, a pivotal point in the lives of these disciples. In this very moment, they are confronted with the reality that they must take Jesus at his terms, on his terms, not on their own. How often do you and I want to take God, to take our Savior, on our terms? And move him along a little bit here and a little bit there, so he fits in with me. No. He moves us a little bit here and a little bit there, and sometimes a lot, so we fit in with him. How many times in this last month or in this last week or even today have you and I come to forks in our roads when we had to decide between the Jesus road and the me road? Which side of the fork did I take? Did you take? Think on them. Be specific for a minute. Try to picture this scene. Jesus with the disciples. Jesus, their teacher, their master, the one they have already acknowledged to be the son of God, is teaching them that he must suffer. He must be killed and he will rise again. And as the scripture said, he spoke plainly about this. He didn't hide it in euphemisms. He didn't sugarcoat it. He just stated the facts. But Peter pulled him aside, away from the group. Not a good sign. And as if Peter had some kind of hidden wisdom that Jesus didn't have. And he didn't want to embarrass Jesus in front of the others. So imagine him putting his arm around him and saying, now Jesus... I know you're the son of God and all that. But you just can't do this. Master, no. You don't say no and master in the same sentence. Wow. Who's the leader here, Peter? Then Jesus turned from Peter and looked at the other disciples and he rebuked Peter as we read in the strongest possible words. And Peter's little superiority act is now fully revealed to the others. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I'm not sure he was calling Peter Satan. I think he was speaking to Satan, who was using Peter to try and derail Jesus from his task of redeeming the world. But nonetheless, Peter was the agent. And Jesus said, you do not have in mind the things of God. Or as the message put it, you have no idea how God works. They had come to a fork in the road. And Peter and the rest had to decide now which road would they take. They wanted to be followers and leaders. They wanted to follow Jesus, they wanted him to, but they wanted to follow him down the path of their own choosing. They wanted to follow from the front. And that's our dilemma. Certainly it's mine. We want to follow Jesus, but we want to lead him in our direction, along our favorite paths, and to the destinations we have in mind. Now, I don't have a cat at the moment, but I've had quite a few cats over the years. And when I did have one, and the cat wanted something, to be let out or to be fed, 
he'd look at me and meow. If he was hungry or wanted some fresh food in the bowl, because what was there was no longer fresh, because it had been there all of five minutes. He would start leading me to where he wanted me to go. And if I didn't go in the right place, he'd come back and stare me down and lead me to where he wanted me. And only then would he follow me. And when he did follow me, he followed me from the front. Isn't that what I want to do with Jesus? Yes, Lord, I'll go wherever you go. As long as where you're, you're going is where I want to go. The way I want to do it. You see, they had no problem with Jesus being the Messiah. As being the savior of the world. But they wanted it all to be on their terms. And they wanted it all to not have a cross. Scripture says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. I see three very significant actions in what Jesus just said. First, he said, whoever would come after me. When you come after, you follow. You follow. You don't come after from the front. You follow. Come after me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. We'd much rather be leaders than followers. If you look at Amazon, I guess, check out the number of books that are written on leadership. And then check out the number of books that are written on following. The call to discipleship, to be a disciple of Jesus, is a call to fellowship, not leadership. And just as Jesus fathered, followed his father's will in going to the cross, we are called to follow Jesus to the cross. Like Peter and my cat, we want to tell Jesus where and how he should lead us. Then we'll follow. It just doesn't work that way. That's not how God works. If anyone would come after me. The second action I see here is a hard one. Well, the first one's not so easy either. The hard one, deny himself. Now, William Barclay explains this in this way. Barclay says, it means saying no to ourselves. Saying no to our natural love of ease and comfort. Yeah. Please don't make me get out of my easy chair. Please don't make me take off my comfortable slippers and put on those heavy working boots. Please don't force me to think beyond my already preconceived notions about God, about my place in the universe, about my responsibilities to the lost and the, the environment and the church, about my responsibilities to the, those around me. And please don't ask me to change my attitudes towards those who are not like me. Just let me be comfortable the way of the cross is not comfortable. We need to say no to our preconceived notions and our unwillingness to move and change, to saying no to our ease and comfort. I need to say no, of course, to any kind of action, any plan that's designed just to make me look good. I must say no to it. Insisting on a course of action just because I want it is not motivated by what's good for the kingdom of God. And I need to say no to our culture. 
this is a countercultural movement, Christianity is. It's revolutionary in our world. But true Christianity has always been revolutionary. Do you remember one of the complaints that the people had against Paul and his other Christians was that they were turning the world upside down? And I need to say no. If I'm going to follow, I need to say no to the instincts and the desires that prompt me to touch and taste and handle forbidden things. All around us, the world is drawing us, luring us in, pulling us in. And the world lies to us and says, why, it's just, it's just a little dalliance. It's just a harmless little white lie. It's just innocent flirting. Just a few pleasurable moments on the edge of, um, well, you know. It's just you fill in the blanks. It's Satan's own lie, as old as the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? And the third action in this word of Jesus is, take up this cross and follow me. Those are really not two commands, they're one command. It's all one because taking up our cross is how we follow him. And if we're not taking up our cross in the form of self-denial, we are not following Jesus. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The disciples were facing a fork in the road. So what forks in your road will you face this week? You might want to keep a three by five card or a notebook handy and begin writing them down. May God give me the grace, may he give you the grace that when a fork in the road in my thinking or my acting towards others comes along, that I will ask God to give me faith to take the Jesus road. Amen. Thank you, Cyril. Would you stand and join together in the hymn of dedication, number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5.
It has been a blessing to be here together this morning. I'm so glad that you've come to worship the Lord together. Hear these words of benediction. May the spirit that leads through fire and flood, the spirit that baptizes with power, the spirit of expectation and hope, lead, strengthen, and guide you this week and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.